Welcome to the webinar, What Top Security Teams Do Differently. I'm so excited to have you guys here uh, with us as we discuss both a little bit about the Press Reset Report, which hopefully everybody here has seen. If not, we'll get into some of the details behind the, the research and some of the reporting. Um, but more importantly, I have two very awesome guests here with us today who have actual stories and insights that might be able to bring the statistics to life and turn them into something you can actually use in 2023 to move your team toward a more mature, more robust, more resilient, and more practical program implementation uh, for this year. So. Thanks again uh, for joining us today, Daniel Spicer and Amanda Wittern. I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Hi, Ashley. It's good to be here. <laughs> um, so some very quick housekeeping uh, to get us started. Uh, as usual, our webinars are going to be completely downloadable and will be have been recorded and you will be able to access them at any time in the future. Um, we're going to be sending an email out, I think, within uh, 24 hours of this live airing. So please go ahead, look out for that email and then share it with anybody on your team who couldn't make it. Uh, the slides are going to be downloadable. This report and other resources, including our ultimate guide to RBVM, uh, risk-based vulnerability management, as well as our cybersecurity toolkit. Um, those are both available completely for free um, on the ON24 platform. So please take a moment to download them now. Uh, you will hear periodically pings I'm told they're very loud pings. Apologies, I can't turn it down. Um, that will remind you to come back to the tab if you're just listening to us. Um, we'll have poll questions for you guys. Some will, will be questions that we've taken directly from the survey to see what you guys uh, would respond uh, and compare that to what the report respondents, our panel uh, kind of responded with. Um, there'll be other questions as well. Please feel free to come back and take those questions. We won't be stopping our discussion, but I hope uh, you'll find them engaging and informative. Uh, at any time, you guys can ask questions. We have a live chat, I swear. Uh, please do ask your questions in chat. We're going to have um, our panelists kind of uh, respond during the webinar. Um, so if you have questions, now is the chance to pick the brains of Amanda and Daniel. Uh, they're really nice and they put up with lots of silly questions from me. So your questions that are actually relevant are going to be great. Um, and with that, um, let's get started. Uh, first thing I actually wanted to start with is a little bit of a twist here. Why is it that larger, let's say enterprise level organizations without naming names, don't automatically have best in class security. I mean, I kind of joked about it on the, um, the landing page invitations for this webinar, uh, you know, they should have unlimited budget to be able to throw out these problems. They should be able to court uh, really highfalutin security folks and the best and brightest minds in security to come on their team. And so if you've got all the money for all the tech and you've got all of the potential capability of wooing the best minds, why is it that larger organizations can be outclassed by smaller ones that do it right? I guess I'll get started. Um, and one of the things I'm, I'm reminded of is an, an article from a while back, which is um, we don't need another InfoSec rock star. Uh, that was the title of, of the article. And I, I appreciated it so much. But I, I also just think that um, a lot of the people who really get stuff done in infosec are probably not the people who are you know loud and and in the rock stars of of the industry right they are are smart people who have seen a lot of things who think about problems the right way uh who have a a a proper problem solving methodology and they they really tackle that and so um you know attracting talent is always important right uh, truly, but um, it's not a, a rock star that I necessarily look for, right? I'm not looking for someone who has like a big famous blog um, or, you know, a bajillion Twitter followers, if 
if Twitter is still a thing by the time this podcast airs. You know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> We're just, mastodon, then. Not mastodon. a mastodon. Yeah, we, we just flip a coin every every few minutes to see if we get like five in a, five heads in a row, like Twitter goes down again. I don't know. So, um, no, but, but, but large followings aren't important. Large followings are not are not what's important. It's it's. Um, People who who know how to tackle tough challenges, who have um, the ability to uh, understand technical content, who are constantly learning. These are the kinds of people who excel in InfoSec. Um, And I I don't believe in rock stars and I don't even necessarily believe in hiring um, out of um, uh, cybersecurity programs right now, which is a bit ironic, right, because I actually (laughs) did graduate from one of those. Um, but but that tells you a lot, right? I, I I look very carefully at those programs. I I know how much people uh, want to come out of those and go and land an infosec job instantly. But there's just so much context that they need to understand about about networking, about servers, about how a business runs, right? That they don't get loaded up for. So I I think um, that's one of the the big things. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll just say, just from my own um, dealings and in incident response, is just because you have the fanciest, like top of line tooling off the shelf, right, kind of means nothing if you didn't configure it properly. You don't have the proper team around it, right? Like getting the the fancy tooling is is not what makes the infosec program. And I know a lot of software vendors in the security space would like to try to tell me otherwise um, as they, they, they try to continue to sell me things. But, but building proper process and getting proper configuration around those tools is way more important. And actually just ha- having that, that in-house expertise on a tool makes up so much difference. Um, and so I, you know, if you just throw money at it, I don't think that's what solves it. The the best infosec teams are the ones who handle their technical debt because that exists in infosec and they build proper processes and they understand how to utilize the technology properly. So so those are the two things that I I think are really important. Amanda, I actually think you and I have had a conversation about this at some point. Um, And I'm going to blend some conversations we've had previously, but allow me to bastardize and paraphrase this. Um, Companies should focus more on hiring the right and training up the right people and not try to compensate for a lack of in-house labor and talent by hiring outside consultants in the latest fancy gear because it takes maintenance and, and setting it up and following through on those recommendations and no amount of fancy consultant is going to be able to f- make you follow through on those three, six, 12 months down the road. And I'm, I'm, I'm pinging you with this because I know you used to be one of those very fancy consultants. You know, I, uh, it's a fine line. I want to say that we're walking a fine line here because in a less mature information security organization, there is absolutely a space for hiring of outside talent, third-party consultants, even a larger organization. There are economies of scale, right, where uh, the ability to get things done because you're large, you can get more licenses of a technology or, you know, et cetera. I, I can't say that there is not a right time for that because sometimes there is, uh, regardless of the size of your organization. Um, you know, what, what Daniel is, is getting at is when you're looking at your own information security program, sometimes it's about getting the right people, not the rock stars with the blogs and infinite experience. Sometimes it's about getting the right mindset, the people who are passionate about, uh, the information security, they're passionate, they're curious, they're learning constantly. I think you and I have had conversations about, you know, the right information security person is somebody who likes to learn, right? 
And so uh, there, there, you do have to do, I, I, I would employ, implore anyone, do the right amount of due diligence, determine the risk, determine the cost of a third party, of a contractor, of an organization that provides, you know, specific types of services for information security versus, some, you know, having somebody from in-house they're not the right people. And sometimes that's what it's about, right? So I feel like, Ashley, that I haven't given you an exact answer here. I personally think if you have the option and you have the right person, bringing someone in-house, if you have the budget to do it and, and you have the ability to do that, is absolutely going to mean you have an invested person who's truly interested in the well-being, the welfare of the organization, of your team, of information security. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the right choice for an organization at the time. And if it comes between having or not having certain like threat intelligence or uh, 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 pen testing or whatever, Absolutely. Consider having the third party gauge where your organization is at. I think we have a pretty incredible team and they're indispensable. And I can't see any one of them being replaced with somebody out of house. So a little selfish there, but I, I, I apologize for the lack of black and white there, Ashley. <laughs> no, it's if nothing else, my time in Avanti has taught me it's all shades of gray. Possibly red and purple if I'm talking with our art director, but it's all shades of gray. Um, I, I was I was on. Let's move then to the cybersecurity maturity scale uh, that we've kind of put together. Um, disclaimer: These are self-reported levels, <laughs> which I'm sure. They still think we can see some really interesting trends, and and we pulled out five aspects of the questions that they had answered in other parts of the survey and compared them with who self-reported at these various maturity levels. And we pulled out leadership buy-in and people who self-reported at the highest maturity level, which in our case was level four. They claim to have repelled advanced threat actors, which is what the person taking the survey believed that to mean. Um, had almost three times were three times as likely to say they had a lot of leadership buy-in versus uh, the the most beginner level cybersecurity programs. You have um, the most mature reporting programs saying that asset visibility was a priority at their organizations as opposed to uh, thirty one percent of the the lowest end. You've got sixty four percent reporting that their supply chain was a priority. I was actually kind of surprised it wasn't higher. Um, as opposed to 29% of the younger, you've got, and, and this is something that I found particularly interesting, you have a whopping 78% of respondents reporting at the max maturity level considering user experience as a center part of their security strategy as opposed to only 35% of the of the lowest maturity level. And then finally, you have cloud security, which everybody, that, that was clearly skewed. A lot of people are considering cloud as a more mature kind of platform these days. Um, it's almost understood. So to you guys, um, I'd like to pitch the question here. Of those five, which do you think is the most attainable to work on in 2023? for an organization to improve from level one to level two or level two to level three or level three to level four, assuming they have average amount of budget and, and some decent, but not rock star people. Um, I think that everything kind of starts with uh, asset visibility personally. Um, I, I've talked about this uh, quite a few times, um, so message, message is consistent at least. Um, but for, for those of you who already heard it, we're going to go through it again. Um, you can't protect what you don't know. It's a pretty basic tenet of, of information security. And so um, uh, having that, that visibility into your assets, where they are, 
um, and you know, you know, the the state of them is is absolutely critical. And I can't tell you how often it was that people just forgot about it. Even even like pretty reasonably sized organizations with a, a lot of people are like, oh, that was supposed to be decommissioned, or you know, we didn't we didn't know that they had stood this up or, um, uh, I have one particular organization of, we were, we, we, we had, uh, decommissioned it and it turned back on by accident. It was a real, real thing. Uh, very, very interesting. And so, um, having that consistent visibility across your organization, having that strong inventory, and then being able to act upon that for, for classification, for vulnerability management, for, for all of these other things that come with it. That's why that's always my, my number one. Um, and also just make the comment that, you know, smaller organizations um, have the best opportunity to fix this because they have the least number of assets, <laughs> especially, especially the cloud first organizations where most of their assets are actually in Azure or AWS, and they're having to pay from a very small pool of money um, as they continue to grow. And I hope you continue to grow, um, small business listeners. Um, you know, they're, they have to keep really close tabs on those assets in, in the cloud. And of course, Azure and AWS is keeping very close tabs on those because that's how they bill you. So you actually have the most opportunity to fix that when you're smaller. The organizations that suffer are the ones who don't fix that early on, right? Like when they move, jump from like a, you know, a hundred, 150 person company into, you know, a 500 person company, that's when, you know, you you started losing the opportunity to actually correct this. Now, when you say opportunity to correct this, I mean, are you talking about you can have a giant whiteboard in the center and you can just up like, what are you talking about when you say correct it? Because obviously we all need to track things, but but what to you would be correcting it in such a way that it could scale to a bigger one? Mm -hmm. And moving from does, moving from a spreadsheet, which is probably how you're handling it at a 100 person company, right, into a proper CMDB, right? That's really that's really the best way to 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 correct this. At, at the point that you have uh, that number of assets, it is worth starting to invest in that over manually having to take care of an Excel spreadsheet. One of the three primary ways that an incident occurs is some kind of, you know, it could be because you didn't patch it or, 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 or something like that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's the root causes. You didn't know it existed or you forgot to that it existed being the issue. And so regardless of what solution anyone picks, right, moving from an Excel spreadsheet to a, a, a proper, you know, managed solution um, at that at that that kind of juncture when you're starting to outgrow um, the Excel spreadsheet, when it when when you when it takes you more than a, 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 a five seconds to scroll through it, right? <laughs> That's probably when <laughs> you should start looking at something better to track. Amanda, anything to add to that that you've seen in the wild, or did you want to pivot to one of the other components? I always liken it to being a sheep herder with his sheep, right? Uh, you have 15 sheep, you have a horse and a dog, and, and you're set, right? But each one of those sheep means so much at only 15 sheep. Uh, you know, the, the percentage, their value, that kind of thing, how, how much you spend. Uh, you get 100 sheep and maybe one isn't quite so important anymore. Uh, but at the same time, now you have many more sheep susceptible, right? So if it's an illness that takes one and you're not quite paying attention because it's just you and your, your dog, then it may take half your flock, right? So it, it's about how you look at it. As companies scale and get larger, um, the risk for an individual thing may be 
may seem smaller, less important, you know, that kind of thing. But the scale at which it can impact becomes larger. And so it's kind of a mindset. At, at what point do the sheep, you know, you get a flock so large, you now need another pasture and another person. And, and it, it's really kind of that game, that, that balancing of uh, what's, what's important, doing that risk reward and making that determination. But as Daniel was talking about that, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got little sheep in my head. There's a little black one and a little white one. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that was a great analogy though, because like you say, some of the sheep, some of the devices aren't going to be like the CEO's laptop anymore. It's going to be some random printer down the hall. And we all know what a nightmare that can turn out to be. Sorry. Sorry. Bad joke. Um, <laughs> But it, it can then facilitate lateral movement and all of those other lovely things that happen when somebody discovers the one sheep you don't pay attention to anymore because it's suddenly not important in the whole herd of 100. So Exactly. That, that's such a nice analogy. <laughs> I, I hope I... That, that, that's very fun. Um, so, okay, so that's asset visibility. Was there one of the other things that, Amanda, you think that um, more... Um, beginner or new organizations could focus on in 2023 um, to really practically and achievably start to move toward um, a, a more robust organization this year? Um, sure. I really like uh, rising preparedness. I think the ability to anticipate attack vectors um, can be both, you know, algorithm based, based as well as just scenario planning. Hey, we're an X organization that makes us susceptible to this type of attack. Um, and and what I really like about that particular uh, facet of these five is that it really takes that passion for curiosity for learning for getting constant um, feeds of current threat, threats, threat actors, what's going on in the market. I think that's a very easy one for an organization of any size to put forth effort and make an impact just by being aware of, of knowing what's going on, of what the trends are. Um, you know, even a report like the one we're talking about here that's that's looking at, you know, uh, what organizations are, are kind of thinking of as a whole. Those trends are vital. They're very, very important in helping make decisions um, as well as forward looking and trying to see what's coming. You know, it's 2023 now. Do you think cultivating that kind of a, a, a team mindset would enable you to spot vulnerabilities within your supply chain, within different creative methods of attack that otherwise would have been missed? Yes. I mean, the, the simple <laughs> answer Absolutely. is the obvious. Absolutely. So, so when you think about information security, it's not, it's not if, it's when, right? You always have to keep in mind that the people who are on the other side, the people who are performing these attacks, they have more resources, more time, more people, more dedication than you will ever have because their whole job is that infiltration, is that hack, right? Where your whole job is whatever business you're working on, right? So, so 100%, absolutely. It's about being on the forefront. It's, it's about creating an environment, fostering an environment where people can remain curious and ask questions, push boundaries. That's what's going to make a creative information security team. Um, Daniel, what do you have to add there? I, I just, um, you know, thinking about, you know, our own team, especially in our, our threat operations team, we rotate them through uh, the threat hunt work. Um, and a lot of that is is very research based, right? We talk about a specific vector or a specific actor, go learn everything about it, go find it in my environment, 
make sure that it's not in my environment? And then also like, how do we make sure that there weren't any gaps in, in our detections for that? How do we improve? And that whole process is, is very uh, educational. And so to, to Amanda's point, right, um, that, that increase in preparation actually helps there. But also like the, the more you the more ways people have of approaching an, a particular obstacle, the more likely you have a chance of succeeding it. So, so um, taking in those different mindsets and constantly giving people that opportunity to learn just will always make your program better. At what kind of obvious things that are going to be obvious in the next year, in the next five years, how can we spot those sooner? I mean, have uh, Amanda, Daniel, have you guys ever responded to an incident or seen an incident or heard a story about an attack vector that you'd never considered before um, or that somebody had suggested this might be a possible vector? The powers that be kind of downplayed it and then it turns out they were right. Um, so I uh, have have on my uh my record uh, responding to one of the very first ransomware attacks, like when when Crypto Locker was like the only ransomware that ever existed. Um, so um, yes, I've I've you know th there's always some some novelty to the really sophisticated threat actors, um, but um, one of the things that uh, occurs to me. Um, and and I, again, I'm going to refer to an article I recently read where there's this uh, new um, unit that the uh, U.S. government appears to be putting together to focus on novel, novel methods of warfare and trying to, like, predict those before they happen. And I was like, hmm, well, I don't, I don't know that there's anything novel. Right. We're just uh, we're just uh, repackaging old tactics. Right. So, you know, um, S supply chain attacks. We, we talked about this on a previous episode. That's not a new method of, of attacking you. Anyone who knows, you know, anything uh, even slightly about like traditional warfare knows that, you know, you have to protect your supply chains and those are vital, especially the further you move into enemy territory. Um, so supply chain attacks in software is just a rehashing of that. And that's why, like, again, being curious and learning and, and some of that history learning as well is just really helpful in, in some of these things. But, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see the newest implementation, I'll say, of, of a strategy. But I, it, it's hard to say that it's new, right? Um, d destruction of, of vital uh, resources like like ransomware basically does or holding a hostage I guess is a a more uh, accurate way of doing it that's blackmail how long has that been around for right it's not that's not new it's new that we're using it to blackmail a company away from their data right I mean for me what has been new but a resurgence of old is social engineering you know, the ability to exploit what really is the weak component in a chain of technology, and that is the people. And it's just, it's the same tricks, uh, it's the same game, but it's a new setting. You know, uh, the technology has improved the locks on buildings and, uh, you know, how you get into you know, logging in passwords and, and even multi-factor, we're seeing, uh, you know, increased attacks with multi-factor fatigue and, and there, you know, it's it, but, you know, so maybe, maybe what we could say here is that the game is the same, but that the threat actors are just evolving to find the weak points in whatever the system is, whatever the weak point is. But I, I, I've just got a kick out of, you know, I surf Reddit and, and watching people get in on stage impersonating someone or just the bizarre things that people are able to do. Uh, but, but, you know, keeping, keeping <laughs> with our conversation, um, you know, remaining alert, remaining curious, 
continual education, uh, I think is important. That's, that's, you've got to be aware of it. You've got to watch for it. I think that's a nice segue to our, our final portion of this particular webinar, which is we identified kind of four areas where based on uh, the reported deficits, self-reported deficits, I will just hammer that self-reported home there, uh, between the, the more mature and advanced organizations versus the more beginner level organizations, um, we found in particular that uh, among other things, Automation, finding ways, automated ways to scale basic operations to eliminate some of that human factor, which is, of course, the weakest link of any supply chain or security wall. Um, an empowerment of the security team to figuring, encouraging all the leaders of companies to let security do what it needs to do and understand that Business operations are important and your security team understands that too, but sometimes you got to invest a little bit of short-term pain to get the long-term resiliency, which brings us to resiliency, a mindset that no matter what you do, to your point, Amanda, something's going to happen. Somebody's going to break. No matter what best-in-class kind of tech you may have implemented or how well it was configured, to Daniel's point, Something at some point is going to happen that you could have never predicted. And so how is your company prepared to deal with that when it does? That is part of what, and I know we've been talking a lot about this internally. Um, I know that that's kind of going to be a theme for the coming year for us, actually. Um, but considering which risks are most important to take care of and which risks are are worth investing in to be the most resilient from and how to compensate and get to an acceptable level of risk and considering more types of risk than just I'm not patched. There, there's more to life than patching, as fun as that is. So out of those four then, were there any you guys wanted to offer some insight, wisdom, stories, anecdotes, emphasis? We can I mean, cut go this. Ahead, but go ahead, Daniel. No, Which one we can do you cut want to this. Take? I think I've, I've, I think Amanda should go first. Distribution is not resiliency. Um, the majority of attacks in 2022, 2021, estimated in 2023 and beyond are ransomware attacks. You need to have backups. You need to have backups. That's just the end all. But it doesn't stop there. Resiliency is also about making sure that you have appropriate things in place should any disaster occur that you can immediately pick up and and keep moving on um but i want to i want to hit home and the reason that i point this out is for empowerment i can say that uh for for the first time in a long time here i have experienced what it's like to be empowered as an information security professional and uh it's incredible having the leeway to do what we know needs to be done and what is right and to see the results that the team that I'm working on, given their curiosity, given their passion and ultimately what we're able to protect against, what we're ultimately able to educate not only our team, but the entire organization what we're able to deflect uh, of, of everything on the list. I'm not sure how you quantify the value and benefit that comes from empowering your information security professionals. Um, but, but if there was some way to do that, uh, I would, I would put it in a little bottle and, and sell it to everyone because it's just, it's so incredible, and we have that. We have that here, and I wish I wish that I could. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to turn this over to you. I swear, I swear. But holistic risk. I'll give you automation. I'll give you that one. Uh, holistic risk management. Now, this is something that that actually most of my professional career has has worked in, and and something that I work on here. But. Every decision that every enterprise makes in the whole world is about what that bottom line will look at. 
Holistic risk management gives you the tools you need to assign those dollars. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to like emphasize the fact that you can translate risk into dollars by proper holistic risk management. But, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of benefits to that. It's about going around your organization and understanding where the risks really are, what would shut down the business, what would slightly impact the business, what would take out this product or that product or, you know, identifying weaknesses. And you, there's a huge plethora, right? Holistic risk management is huge. And I'll give Daniel an opportunity to add on to if he wants. But, but if I were to sum it down, the reality is that magic little bottle that I could retire tomorrow, understanding, defining and documenting your business, what makes money and what doesn't what affects or can impact and taking that curiosity that we talked about and, and applying that and then being able to package that all up in a nice bow and give that to management. So while I talk about resiliency in, you know, in, in C-suite, please, dear God, back up. When I talk about environment in C-suite, please, dear God, empower your information security professionals. When I talk about holistic risk management, it's to our information security and our IT folks. This is your opportunity to be able to take and translate the daily operations of a business into dollars that can then translate into your C-suite. And that's the locomotion. That's the vehicle that can drive your trajectory from level one to level two to level three, right? And these improvements along your information security maturity journey. Okay, Daniel. All right. All right. I, 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 no, I was very I passionate the, about some of these items. No, no, it's you great. You can take it away. The, the risk management thing, I, just to, to reiterate, like that is the closest thing InfoSec has to an ROI, right? Like you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have a real way of, of showing that your EDR solution or that extra head is, is going to, you know, give back some profit to the business, right? So you, you have to have a way of translating, you know, this is the potential risk. This is how we can bring that risk down in dollars, right? And, and that's why it's so important. And um, it's important to make sure that you're contextualizing your risk as well. One of the things that I, I, I caught myself earlier, uh, Ashley, we were, we were talking about this, right? Um, you're like, well, what is an advanced adversary? And like, I gave you my opinion of an advanced adversary based off of Avanti, right? For, for a lot of other organizations, you, you may not have the same type of, of risk profile or threat. And so, um, it's really important to, to dig in on the, the risk management piece. Your program will hit very significant roadblocks until you can have an intelligent conversation with risk um, to your C-suite and especially, especially your CFO. Because remember, like risk is based in economics, right? And so that is the, the way to talk to, to the person who really understands the financial impact should you, your operation fail, right? Um, you know, I, I, I do also want to touch a little bit on resiliency. You, you take stock and you do, uh, the gap assessment. One of the things that I actually spent a lot of time working on is, is just trying to make sure the team was prepared to, to react, um, making sure that they had proper playbooks, improving the instant response, um, plan, some of those things. And so resiliency about backups is super critical, but I also just want to make sure that like people are, are prepared to react because at the end of the day, like we're kind of like firefighters in, in this, um, role, right? We're, we're constantly responding to emergencies and hopefully putting out a lot of small fires and not letting them get too big. But um, getting your team prepared to handle those fires, that, that's really, um, really important, um, I, I think. And, and I think I was actually a little surprised about how much time that's what I, I spent doing first. Because, um, you know, there are tons of things that you can work on first. And, you know, um, but, but that was the one that we focused on is making sure we were able to handle the day-to-day -day fires that came up. And maybe even a little bit beyond that, just to make sure that, you know, when some of these more common attacks, you know, happen, we already had a, a playbook or 
you know, we at least had a playbook that we could adapt to support something that may be a little bit more novel. Um, but, um, you know, I, that's just something that, of course, near and dear to my heart based on my background. So, um, but then the, the last thing I, I want to talk about here is actually the automation piece. And I think this is slightly later, actually, in, in the journey here um, than these other ones. Um, the, the automation piece is what helps you scale. Because once you've gotten to the point where um, cybersecurity is important enough for and you're a large enough organization to have a dedicated cybersecurity team, uh, eventually budget realities will hit you, right? And um, unless you are a big company that prints money, we know that some of those exist, right? Um, you will need to find a way to scale. Having one or two people, preferably, who have uh, a little bit of scripting experience, um, who, who can understand how the different APIs work and, and be able to read that kind of documentation very easily, and be able to get things to interconnect um, will we'll go a really long way to scaling out your team because the, the best investment you can make to, to scaling is automating little daily things that isn't worth your team's job. And quite frankly, it goes a long way to their like personal satisfaction and happiness with their day to day as well. Because if, if it's something that can be automated, probably nobody wants to be doing I mean, I 100% agree with that, both that when someone can own a project, it makes it so much more personal. And also, the more you can automate, the more satisfied I'm going to be with my job. If only I could automate my expenses or something. But Daniel, you know, when it when it comes to you know, Avanti, or maybe just organizations as a whole, like, where do you start with automation? Is it just daily reminders of meetings that are coming? Like, what do you, when you talk about automate, what are we talking about? The organization. Um, one of the things that I really like automating is um, around system onboarding. Uh, anything that you can do to make system onboarding uh, automated actually reduces your long-term technical debt. Um, but I also really like automating certain um, audit functions. And I know that's a, a weird thing to hear, but, but hear me out. Um, it's actually not all that difficult to write a script that automatically compares, you know, a firewall rule export um, from six months ago to now so that you're focused in on on auditing a smaller subset or to um, automatically extract um, where your privileged users are out of certain systems so that you can audit your privileged users more effectively. And so um, small things like that are actually big time savers and in the long run may allow you to audit not just more effectively, but more often because you've taken out a bunch of lead time that's essentially busy work. Okay, that makes sense. And I really like that because oftentimes, by the time you get to the point where there is audit, there has already surpassed the opportunity to document. And so adding that component in is just, speeding that process along that that maturity along i love that well exactly and that's why i feel very strongly that of the um four things that, that we're talking about here automation actually just comes later when when you already have some processes when you when you already have your tool set when you 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 start hitting that that people budget limit that's when the automation investment starts really paying off because you're just chipping away at the time that your team is wasting. Uh, you're just making them more efficient. And uh, there are people who just love automating things. They love those little scripts. They take a lot of pride in them. Uh, and I love finding those people and hiring them uh, because they're, they're such a benefit to the organization. Thank you so much for coming to today's webinar. Um, Amanda, Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us. We really appreciate it. Um, 
I'm going to make sure that all of the named resources that we have um, that we've mentioned throughout our discussion today, as well as some additional pieces are going to be in the webinar slides as well. So please do take a moment to go ahead and uh, download the webinar slides, download the extra materials. I promise this is a safe PDF. I don't know how to put in a malicious one, even if I wanted to. Um, but all of the resources are there for you to get started. Um, and Find us, ask more questions if you'd like later. This has really been a joy. I hope this has been helpful for all of you. Thank you so much again.